I'm here to talk about the Feasts of Israel. Uh, the Feasts are probably the greatest signpost uh, in terms of prophetic signposts that the Bible offers in the Old Testament. It is stunning. These are the times of the signs. We need to be able to read the signs. Uh, in fact, I have some actual signs here that you might be interested in. These are signs that are hanging up all over the country. In the front door of a funeral home, the sign says, Drive carefully, we'll wait. <laughs> On an electrician's truck, the sign says, Let us remove your shorts. <laughs> On a maternity room door, guys, that's where ladies have babies. On a maternity room door, the sign says, Push, push, push! <laughs> At an optometrist's office, the sign says, if you don't see what you're looking for, you've come to the right place. <laughs> in a veterinarian's waiting room, the sign says, we'll be back in five minutes. Sit, stay. <laughs> now this one you have to think about a little. This is on, a, on an electric company's door. The electric company's sign says, we would be delighted if you would pay your bill. However, if you don't, you will be delighted. <laughs> Uh, okay. Give me a break. <laughs> a hostile crowd. We are living, guys, in the times of the signs. And one of the most amazing signposts is the seven feasts of Israel. The seven feasts are actually introduced in Leviticus 23. Did you bring your Torah with you? Yes. Bring, uh, go to the third book of the Torah, the book of Leviticus, chapter 23. Leviticus chapter 23. And, um, Reading from verse 1, the Lord speaking to Moses on behalf of the Jewish people, Israel. He says, the Lord said to Moses, give the following instructions to the people of Israel. These are the Lord's appointed festivals or feasts, which you are to proclaim as official days for holy assembly. Verse 4, these are the Lord's appointed feasts, the official days for holy assembly that are to be celebrated at their proper time each year. Holy feasts. The Hebrew is actually mikra kodesh, which literally means holy rehearsals. What's a rehearsal? A rehearsal is something that's in preparation for the main event, right? Mm -hmm. Well, dear ones, these seven feasts of Israel are rehearsals. They are preparatory. They are looking forward to the main event, which is the story of human redemption. Amazingly, the seven feasts, which are offered as a package in the Bible, they don't include such festivals as Purim or Hanukkah, those are also biblical Jewish holidays, but these seven feasts present the entire package of human redemption. From the cross to the kingdom to come, the entire story is woven into the seven feasts. I love how the, they are written in time. They're written right into the calendar. You know, monuments are going to crumble and words are going to be forgotten. But time will remain until we don't need time anymore. The Feasts of Israel, a picture of the story of redemption. Now, if you look at the feast, it appears at first glance to be a farmer's calendar. But if you study it a little bit more, you realize that the New Testament instructs us that it, it's divinely intended to be prophetic of God's dealing with two entities in particular. Firstly, with Israel. They were originally given to Israel. But secondly, through Israel, with the church. Now you can view the feast from three different perspectives, historically, prophetically, and personally. Historically, we can just study the feast as the Jews have for 3,500 years. These are old festivals. Prophetically, you can study the feast because they prophesy with uncanny accuracy events which would occur in the ministry of Jesus Christ and His Church. And you can actually study them personally as well because each of the feasts outlines your walk with the Lord as you grow and mature in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. So see what I mean as we go on. Now the first of these feasts is Passover. Most of you have heard of it. Many of you have had Passover festivals before in your home or in other homes. Passover is the first and fundamental foundational feast. It is a freedom celebration. Freedom from what? Well, it was a hopeless situation. If you recall, this is, we're talking about three millennia ago. The Jews found themselves in a hopeless situation. They were slaves in Egypt. They were in a nation which had made genocide a matter of national policy. Every day was kill a Jew day. I'm not trying to be funny. 
They had no power in themselves to escape. They were a broken, afflicted people. They cried out to God, it says in Exodus chapter 2. And the scripture says that God heard the cries of the Jewish slaves and he would redeem them. He would purchase them back. How would he do it? Would he give them, rain down Uzi machine guns? Would he give them pit bull terriers? How would he redeem them? Amazingly, he would redeem them from the strongest nation on the planet through the weakest vehicle, dead lambs. God said in Exodus chapter 12 to the Jewish people, if you want to have any hope of escaping this impossible situation where you are destined to become extinct as a nation, every man must take to himself a lamb, a young male lamb. It must be unblemished. You have to examine it for three and a half days. If after that three and a half days it still appears to be spotless, perfect, unblemished, innocent, slash its throat. Take hyssop, dip the blood of the lamb around the, the entrance to your dwellings. Take the body of the lamb, don't break any bones. Eat the body of the lamb. And God says, if you do this, you will be saved by the blood and bodies of innocent lambs. God would pass over Egypt that night, and if he saw a family which by faith had received the blood, had taken in the body of the lamb, they were shielded by the blood. The firstborn wouldn't die that night. Why? Because the lamb died in the place of the, innocent, of the guilty. Israel was saved by the blood of the lamb. Mm -hmm. Dear ones, it's not a coincidence that Jesus was first introduced to the world as the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. It's not a coincidence that he was first uh, announced to shepherds, who are very good at finding lambs, by the way. It's not a coincidence he was born not in a hotel or a castle, he was born in a, a barn. That's where you'd look for a lamb. Dear ones, Jesus <coughs> is the Lamb of God. Mm -hmm. And on the very day of Passover, as little animal lambs for 1,500 years had been brought into Jerusalem on this day of Passover, wild-eyed with fear as their heads were drawn back, their throats slashed, their, their blood spilled, their, their bodies roasted on wooden spits, all as a way of remembering God's redemptive grace in Egypt. It was on that day that Jesus spilled his blood. He too was roasted on a Roman spit. None of his bones were broken. And so it says in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7, Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Hallelujah. Amen. Passover fulfilled in the death of the Lamb of God. Brothers and sisters, you need a Passover. If you haven't had a Passover, all the other feasts are superfluous, they're meaningless, you have nothing to look forward to. Because you, like my <coughs> Israelite relatives from 3,000 years ago, you were born in a hopeless situation. You had no power in yourself to save yourself. You had to have a Moses show up one day and say, there's a lamb, there's a blood, there's a body, there's a sacrifice, there's an innocent who is willing to die for you, the guilty. And you must, by faith, apply the blood of that lamb to the lintel and doorpost of your heart where you really live. Because, dear ones, one day there will be a judgment. And God will pass over you, too, if he sees the blood of an innocent on your heart. Mm -hmm. Have you had your Passover? I pray you have. Mm -hmm. Because if you haven't, God help you. Mm -hmm. You have nothing to look forward to, Hebrews says, except the judgment of your soul. Now, the second of these feasts is called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, tell me, after Israel's Passover experience, what was their primary activity for some time thereafter, other than murmuring? <laughs> what were they doing for about 40 years? Walking, okay. This is a walking feast. Now you may have noticed how the Bible uses walking to represent the business of our daily conduct. Colossians says, as you have received Christ Jesus, so walk in Him. 2 Corinthians says, we walk by faith, not by sight. Ephesians says, walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Guys, the Feast of Unleavened Bread is a walking feast, and interestingly, it corresponds with our walk with the Lord. You'll see that as we go on. 
Now, there are three conspicuous characteristics about the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Number one, no leaven. Well, that's obvious. It's the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Eight times in five verses, God says in Exodus 12, no leaven for the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Keep it out of your body, keep it out of your house. It is taboo for the feast. Leaven in the Bible is a symbol of what? Sin, evil, corruption. Consistently a symbol of sin because it's so much like sin. Leaven and sin are amazingly similar. It just takes a little bit to corrupt the whole of its host. Mm -hmm. Folks, as you're sitting here, you are breathing in leaven spores. Sorry, but that's the truth. You can't, you can't go anywhere on the earth where you're not receiving leaven. This is Satan's domain. There is nowhere on this cursed earth where you will not be subject to the influence of sin. Leaven and sin are very, very similar. Feast of unleavened bread, no leaven. Secondly, it is, a, it is attached to the Passover. It's fascinating. This is nowhere seen in any of the other feasts. As soon as Passover ends, immediately, welded into the Passover is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. They are organically attached. They are welded together. They are un inseparable. In fact, most Jewish people, I can tell you as a Jew, most Jewish people don't even know there is a Feast of Unleavened Bread. They think Passover and Unleavened Bread are the same feast. They don't even know about it. That's how wedded they are. Thirdly, the Feast of Unleavened Bread is a seven-day feast. Seven is an important number in the Bible. It represents wholeness, perfection, and in the context of time, such as this, seven days, it represents a period of time where God performs something whole and perfect. No leaven, welded to the Passover, seven-day feast. So what is God saying through the Feast of Unleavened Bread to Israel? Well, first of all, I think the general message to Israel is, look guys, I didn't redeem you through the Passover lamb so you could put in for early retirement at the Sinai Hilton. I saved you for a reason. I gave you the Lamb of God for a reason. While the rest of the world feasts on a, on a diet of leaven, while the rest of the world gorges on sin, you are to remain unleavened. You are to demonstrate the magnificent benefits of walking an unleavened walk. Dear ones, the Feast of Unleavened Bread is a picture of God's call to holiness, to sanctification. It is a call which is welded to the Passover. As you have received Christ Jesus, that's your Passover experience, so walk in Him. The Feast of Unleavened Bread. 1 Corinthians 5 talks about we being unleavened lumps, okay? We are in Jesus' unleavened dough. He says, keep the feast, not with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Why? Because Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Passover unleavened bread, welded together. Have you ever met someone who's had the Passover but hasn't begun the walk? Oh yeah, Jesus, the Lamb of God, sure, I believe he died for my sins. I mean, somebody had to. But <coughs> walk, a holy walk? I don't know about that, you know, I'm kind of young and I kind of really want to play the field, so maybe later, maybe I'm old like you, Scott, you know, maybe one day I'll, I'll walk the holy walk, but not now. Dear ones, someone like that is an anomaly in the universe. Someone who has separated the Passover from unleavened bread, he's not, not really a child of God because he's living like a worldling, but he's not a worldling because he's been blood-bought by the Lamb of God. He doesn't fit. And you'll find lives like this meaningless and empty. Dear ones, walk the walk. It's attached to the Passover. Now what are we talking about? Are we talking about you being unleavened in the sense of being perfect? Perfect performance? Absolutely not. In fact, in 1 John chapter 1, it says, If you say you have no sin, you deceive yourself and call God a liar. No, we struggle with sin. Walking the unleavened walk, keeping the Feast of Unleavened Bread, is a call to holiness. But dear ones, holiness in this life is the struggle against sin. Are you struggling against sin? If you are, that's a good thing. 
That says that, the, that holiness is operative in you. You're walking the walk. Praise God. And how do we cleanse ourselves of this leaven? Confession and repentance. Confession and repentance. That's the broom and the mop. We can do it every day, all day. God is satisfied with this. If you confess your sins, He's faithful and just to do what? Forgive us. Cleanse you. Forgive you. That's the walk. It's a seven-day feast. What does that mean? Well, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians to serve the Lord in righteousness and holiness. How long? A week? Two weeks? No. All the days of your life. The seven days of your life. The Feast of Unleavened Bread is a call to holiness. Now, I also said these are prophetic feasts. Indeed, Jesus fulfilled the Passover by dying as the Lamb of God. The Feast of Unleavened Bread makes reference to another moment in Jesus' life and history. Now, you may recall that Jesus continually alluded to himself as bread. In John chapter 6, he says, I'm the bread of life, the manna which came down from heaven. On the Passover night, he took what kind of bread? Unleavened bread. He broke it, he blessed it, he gave it to his disciples. He says, take, eat, this is unleavened bread. He likens himself to unleavened bread. But he also said something amazing in, in John chapter 12, verse 24. He said, unless a grain of wheat, again alluding to himself as bread, unless a grain of wheat enters into the ground dead, it remains alone. But if it dies and is buried, it will bear much fruit. Brothers and sisters, at the very moment the Feast of Unleavened Bread was commencing, about 2,000 years ago, Jesus the grain of wheat, the bread of life, the manna from heaven, was being placed dead in the ground in a rich man's tomb. The Feast of Unleavened Bread can um, fulfill in the burial of the Lord Jesus Christ. The thing about it is, when you place a grain of wheat dead into the ground, what does the scripture say? It bears much fruit. By no coincidence, the next feast is called the Feast of First Fruits. The Feast of First Fruits. He wouldn't remain in the ground long, and that now we come to the Feast of First Fruits. Now, in, to, to Israel, the, the Feast of First Fruits is a celebration of the barley harvest. Remember, I told you these are agricultural memorials, uh, most of these festivals. This is a celebration of the barley harvest, which is a springtime festival. Now, in Israel, the first crop to rise out of the dead, cold ground is barley. I am not a farmer, but I love talking to farmers about barley. Because usually they'll tell me something like this. If you want to plant something that you know is going to burst through the death of winter, if you want to plant something that is full of vitality, full of life, that will overcome the dead of winter's cold, plant barley. Barley is a faithful uh, grain. Now in the Bible, in Leviticus 23, it says on a specific day, the Feast of First Fruits was to be kept this way. The Jewish high priest was instructed to cut a sheaf of this first crop and wave it before the Lord. This was a wave offering, a first fruit offering. Now Leviticus 23 says that this day was to be the morrow after the Sabbath, after Passover. Alright, so when is the Jewish Sabbath? What day are we? Saturday, right. The morrow after the Sabbath? Sunday. So the first Sunday after Passover every year, the Jewish high priest cuts that sheaf of first fruit barley, waves it before the Lord. It becomes an IOU for future harvest. Stick with me. To the Jewish mind, first fruit represents two things. First of all, the best. Generally, the first crop of hay is your best crop. Am I correct, farmers? Okay, good. It's also kind of like a divine IOU. The first fruit offering was God saying to Israel, if this faithful fruit from the dead cold ground is raised before me, I promise future harvest for Israel. But if this sheep is not risen, there is no guarantee of future rising. Did Jesus fulfill this feast? Oh yes, in a very big way. I'm reading from 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first, first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But each one 
in its own order. Christ the first fruit, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. Dear ones, think about it. On the very day, what day? The morrow after the Sabbath after Passover. On the very day that the high priest was waving that faithful first fruit of garlic. Jesus Christ, our first fruit, was bursting through death and becoming a guarantee of future harvests of souls. Friends, if Christ is not risen, neither will you. The feast of first fruits fulfilled in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Passover, the death of the Lamb, unleavened bread, the burial of the grain of wheat, first fruit, the rising of the sheaf of barley. It comes now to the fourth feast, the Feast of Pentecost. Now, the Feast of Pentecost is called by the Jews Shavuot, which simply means sevens. Sevens. Now, it's an anniversary party and, and it's a birthday party. First of all, it's a celebration of the anniversary of the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. Remember, Moses goes up, receives the Ten Commandments, comes down the mountain. On that day, that was the Feast of Pentecost. <coughs> it's also a birthday party for Israel because this marks the birth of their nation. When they received the, the Ten Commandments, that was their national constitution. That birthed them as a nation. All right, so once Israel was established in the Promised Land, Leviticus 23 says, keep the Feast of First, or, excuse me, keep the Feast of Pentecost seven weeks plus one day after the previous feast, Feast of First Fruits. So math major, seven weeks plus one day is 50. 50 days from first fruits uh, brings you to the Feast of Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks. Now, here is how it's supposed to be kept. This is bizarre. Listen to this. First of all, God says for the Feast of Pentecost in Deuteronomy chapter 16, He says, I want Jews and Gentiles together to keep this feast. Now you can almost hear the objections of the Israelites. Wait a minute, Lord, these are the Feasts of Israel. God says, I know. But for this feast, I want Jews and Gentiles gathered together as one worshiping body. Now, if that's not strange enough, get this. In Leviticus 23, God says, I want a special offering, a bloodless offering for this feast. I want you to bring two loaves of bread before my holy presence. And those loaves are to contain, guess what? Leaven. Now wait a minute, guys. Leviticus 2, verse 11 says, You are not allowed to bring any grain offering before the presence of God that contains leaven. It is taboo. God is holy. You don't bring a symbol of sin before God and survive. Except on Pentecost. He says, for this one I make an exception. So what's going on here? Is God going to fuse? No, I mean no irreverence. Guys, what we have here is an amazing foreshadow of the church. Jews and Gentiles coming before the one true God is an offering that pleases Him. Two loaves, Jews and Gentiles, and those loaves contain what? Sin. Church, I have a test question for you. Does the church contain sin? Yes. Oh, you didn't have to pray about that, did you? <laughs> if you're not sure, um, if you can discreetly look to the left and to the right. <laughs> If you have enough foot spot and courage, look inside. If that doesn't convince you there's sin in the church, go to the kingdom parables of Matthew 13. Go to 1 John chapter 1. All these reminders that we struggle. We are still, we are righteous and holy before God, but we are struggling with sin as long as we're in this flesh. Yes, there is sin in the church. You ever met the Christian who's looking for the perfect church? Are you one of them? Yes. <laughs> You know, he's, went, he's gone to the east side of Alex, and I, I'll never go back to that church because they don't do enough of this, whatever this is. And he went to the west side, never again am I going there because they don't do enough of that, whatever that is. Can't find the perfect church. If you find this guy, tell him, please, if you find the perfect church, please don't join. You'll ruin it. <laughs> there is sin in the church here. But the amazing thing is that God accepts us as an offering that's pleasing before Him. Remember, this is only the fourth feast. By the time we get to the seventh, we will be adorned as a bride, holy and righteous before Him. Hallelujah. Yeah. And we still have access to the Holy of Holies by reason of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Now, Passover. Jesus, the Lamb of God, dies. 
Feast of unleavened bread, the grain of wheat is buried. Feast of first fruits, the, the risen sheaf, Jesus our first fruits. Now according to the Bible, after Jesus was resurrected, he was seen by how many days? Anybody remember Acts chapter 1 verse 3? 40. 40 days. And 40 days after his resurrection, he said to his disciples, guys, wait in Jerusalem. Don't go anywhere until you receive power to become my witnesses. Jesus rises, uh, ascends to the Father. 40 days after the, the resurrection, guess how long they waited? 10 days. 40 plus 10 is what? 50, 50 days from first fruits brings you right to the Feast of Pentecost. Brothers and sisters, on the very day when the Jewish people had been celebrating the birth of the nation Israel, God birthed the church. On the very day when the Jewish people had been celebrating uh, the receiving of the law scribed on tablets of stone, on that very day, God scribed His law on the fleshy tablets of 3,000 Jewish hearts. Hallelujah. The Feast of Pentecost fulfilled in the birth and empowerment of the church. Now folks, those first four feasts have all been fulfilled in history. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and the birth of the church. And if you were to look at a, a feast calendar, you would see that these first four feasts are kind of bunched up in the spring and early summer of the year, speaking in northern hemisphere terms. There's a four-month lapse, and then the last three are bunched in the autumn in the northern hemisphere. Now that four-month lapse is a time in, in Israel where they're working in the fields. It's a time of laboring in the fields. And interestingly, even the pause is prophetic. Now we've had the first four, we're waiting for the last three, we're in the four-month period right now. And even this pause is prophetic because there's a parenthetical age in God's redemptive calendar. It's a time of laboring in the fields. That's what we're doing right now. We're sowing gospel seeds. We're preparing for that next incredible harvest. It is the age of evangelism. Jesus himself makes reference to this four-month period. In John chapter 4, verse 35, Jesus says these words. Listen. Do you not say there are still four months, and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look. The fields are already white for harvest. Dear ones, this is where we are right now. And we should have a sense of urgency about it because it's destined to come to a very sudden and dramatic conclusion at the sound of a trumpet. The fifth feast and the last one we're going to talk about this morning is the Feast of Trumpets. And central to this feast, both in truth and tradition, is the shofar. Now, folks, the shofar is not... Um, the little guy with the black hat that drives rich people around. Uh, that's a chauffeur, I'm talking about a chauffeur, and you're a great church, you must have one somewhere, right? No, I didn't Oh yeah, sure. <laughs> this is it, the, sh the chauffeur, and in order to understand the Feast of Trumpets, you really need to understand the chauffeur. This is a ram's horn from Jerusalem. So I'm going to give you a quick little overview of what this represents in the Bible. Number one, the chauffeur was blown for the coming of the king. Whenever the king of Israel would, would approach a civilian group, the shofar was blown as a way of saying, lift up your heads, the king is coming. <coughs> Secondly, it was a call of alarm by the watchmen on the walls of old Jerusalem. Ezekiel 36, 37, 38, you see the watchmen on the walls. If they saw a threat approaching to the city, they would blow the shofar. Everyone hearing the sound of the shofar would know, come back to the safety of the walls. A sound of alarm, a sound of the coming of the king. It was also used to announce heavenly events. If you read the Psalms, every now and then you'll hear, blow the shofar in the new moon. So even today, in 2017, every new moon, the shofar is blown. And interestingly, it's also a symbol of resurrection from the dead. <coughs> resurrection from the dead. Now, there's an amazing tradition. This is not in the Bible. It's a Jewish tradition. And it looks to I, um, Genesis chapter 22. Anybody remember what happened in Genesis 22? Give you a hint, old man, teenage son. <laughs> Abraham and Isaac, right? After three days of suffering over this message, Abraham yields. He takes his teenage son, Isaac, 
to the top, top of Mount Moriah. He binds him. He's about to offer him as a sacrifice to God. He doesn't understand it, but this is the, the voice of God. He raises the knife. A, vo a, a, a voice uh, is heard. Abraham! Abraham! And he looks back, and what does he see? A ram caught by its shofars in a thicket. And the ram actually becomes a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, an innocent dying in the place of the guilty. Anyway, the point is, according to Jewish tradition, this is not in the Bible, it's tradition, the two horns of Isaac's rams became God's shofars, God's trumpets. It would be blown twice in history. Now, the, the tradition says the first one would be blown at the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. Well, guess what? It happened. Exodus chapter 19, the Israel, Israelites are gathered around the mountain. The mountain starts quaking and shaking. There's smoke and fire. And suddenly, at the long sound of the trumpet, Moses goes up, the Lord comes down, and the two meet in the air on Mount Sinai. Huh, that's an interesting picture. At the sound of the trumpet. Guess what the tradition says about the last horn of Isaac's ram? The tradition says that with the last trump, the Messiah of Israel will call forth the resurrection of the dead. <laughs> Hallelujah. This is one of those times when truth and tradition don't conflict. Reading from 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Rabbi Paul says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trump will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall all be changed. Praise God. You ever sung that hymn? When he shall come with... Trump and sound. Trump and sound is a few old enough to remember. <laughs> Sing it with me. When he shall come with trump and sound, oh, may I then in him be found. Feast of trumpets, dear ones. Prophetic of the rapture of the church. Wow. You want to hear this then? Yes. All right. I'm not really that good at it. My youngest child, Hallie, is great at this. Anyway, give it a go. Boy, you're really attentive. <laughs> Never been this quiet this whole day. I'm, I'm really not great. still here. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Folks, an amazing sound that we should be looking forward to for the church. An uh, announcement of heavenly events, the king coming, a time of journeying, a great hope for the church. But for Israel, dear ones, as I close, the shofar will sound an alarm more terrible than any in her 4,000 year history. Folks, with the church removed at the sound of the trumpet, evil will be unrestrained, according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The church is called salt and light. What does salt and light do? Salt prevents decay. Light dispels darkness. With the church removed, darkness and decay will fall on the earth like never before. And Zechari Zechariah prophesies in chapter 14, verse 2, that in the context of this darkness, all the nations of the earth, including New Zealand, will gather against Jerusalem, and two-thirds of the Jewish population will be slaughtered. The last Holocaust of 75 years ago, one-third, one of every three Jews was murdered for the crime of being Jewish. In the coming Holocaust, it will be twice the proportions. Folks, I'm not trying to be sensational. I'm not trying to wave my little Israeli flag and make you sentimental and sympathetic. This is prophecy. It will come true. Mm -hmm. Imagine if you had three kids. Some of you do. And one day a heavenly visitor knocks on your door and says, I've got some very, very hard news. Two of your three children will be murdered in cold blood not too long from now. But one will be saved. I'm very sorry, there's nothing we can do about it. What would you do? I'll tell you exactly what you would do. You would stop everything, and you would invest every fiber of your being toward ushering three of your children to the safety of salvation. If you can't save their bodies, at least know that their souls are eternally saved. 
Dear ones, two out of three of the children of Israel are in this position right now. Yeah. And that's why I say with absolute confidence, there's an unusual sense of urgency for Jewish evangelism. Mm -hmm. I'm begging you to pray for us. Mm -hmm. I'm asking you to be a faithful witness to Israelis who come to Alex. They will, and they are. If nothing else, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. God enjoins us to do that. <laughs> Partner with us, I pray that you will. Sign up on that little sheet back there. Be in touch with what we're doing. This summer, we anticipate sharing the gospel with 1,400 Israeli visitors. Every year, it's a little bit more. It was 1,300 last year. Please pray for us. Apart from your prayer, this whole ministry is superfluous. May you pray with me right now. Avinu v'malkinu, our Father and our King. Thank you so much for the Lamb. <laughs> Thank you for providing blood and body of an innocent to die for guilty me. And I ask as we walk through these feasts which you brought through Israel 3,500 years ago, that we would be faithful to blow the shofar to the Jew and Gentile alike, sound an alarm that there is a judgment coming, that there is a lamb who has given his blood and body, who has actually given his life to exchange for those of us who need to get a life. May we be faithful witnesses to the Jew first and also to the Gentile as you have instructed us. Hashem Yeshua HaMashiach in Jesus' name. Amen.